Hello dear students, my name is Sitaramam Kakarala. I am currently the Vice Chancellor of Glocal University and I am going to discuss today Chapter 1, Module 1 from the course Human Rights Law and Practice. The module is about the idea of human rights, a southern perspective. Before I go to the details of the module, I would like to present an overview of the uh, entire course, this being the first module. This particular course, Human Rights Law and Practice, is an uncommon course or a non-standard course. If it is a course like International Human Rights Law, or it is a course related to a particular issue like rights of children or rights of women, we already have a relatively standardized syllabus and methodology of teaching. But Human Rights Law and Practice, which was one of the earliest courses taught in the national law schools in India, way back in early 90s, the course was conceptualized and taught by Nandita Haksar, a very prominent human rights activist and a Supreme Court lawyer. And I was very fortunate to have an early association as a young faculty in teaching that particular course. And therefore, the care that needs to be taken in this particular course is conceptualization and a framing of the syllabus which is not a very standard kind of a syllabus. The other thing that I would like to also specify in the beginning is the kind of influences that my own framing of this particular course uh, influenced by. Academically, the course is very significantly influenced by recent critical currents in legal studies in India. Uh, especially the work of Upendra Bakshi, Partha Chatterjee and such other scholars, I would not be able to name all of them, but their writings is very, very critically influential in framing this particular course. In a very similar way, my view of looking at human rights law and practice has been significantly influenced by the inspirational work that was done by a number of human rights lawyers, especially the names that I would like to mention are uh, Mr. K. G. Kanabiran and Dr. K. Balgopal, whose work in human rights law in India is very well known. Now let me begin with broad introduction to the entire course. The course is broadly divided into seven chapters. The first two chapters deal with conceptual context of teaching human rights law and practice in a non-Western or post-colonial setting like India. It is important to recognize that human rights law is taught in a particular way in the mainstream Euro-American universities. It is true that in many uh, universities in India as well, the similar sort of teaching happens. But it is also important to recognize that there are conceptual as well as empirical differences that need to be identified in presenting our own story of human rights. And this particular course will make an attempt, not so much to give a satisfactory answer, but an attempt to tell how probably one could understand human rights in a non-Western uh, world. The third chapter deals with the idea of human rights lawyering, which is a very important topic for our context. It will look at various traditions of human rights lawyering. For instance, as part of civil liberties movement, there has been a long tradition of legal aid and uh, lawyering that happened in for fighting for uh, human rights protection. In a very similar way, uh, we have human rights lawyering, which is far more professional or individualized practice orientations in India. Uh, the chapter gives an overview of the kind of trends and try and work out a broad typology of uh, framing these new human rights lawyering initiatives in India and also across the world. The fourth chapter deals with broadly national human rights mechanisms, 
in a very, very cursory overview. Unfortunately, given the, uh, the constraints of time, etc., we will not be able to get into the details of these mechanisms, but we will hope to discuss very broadly what these mechanisms are and the basis of those mechanisms and maybe a broad perspective on the way they have been working over the last couple of decades in India. Chapter 5 and 6 deal with two applied themes which are very critical for human rights lawyering and human rights law and practice in uh, a third world country like India. Uh, chapter 5 deals with the issues of development and democracy vis-a-vis -vis human rights which is a very, very current and important topic uh, with uh, India moving towards uh, a greater pace of development, uh, growth-oriented policies and such other issues. So there are many implications for thinking about human rights and there is a particular way by which we can understand uh, in this particular context. The chapter 6 deals with uh, human rights at the wake of new technologies, especially the communication technologies question, but also a variety of other things linked to the communication technologies, be it internet, be it other communication technologies which have an implication for questions like privacy, questions like speech, questions like surveillance. And I think all of them uh, have emerged as key critical issues in talking about human rights in our times and uh, this particular chapter looks at that particular issue. Finally, it concludes with a small chapter on thinking about how we should look at human rights in this context of globalization and the rapidly changing times. What kind of challenges human rights face in this particular moment of our history in terms of understanding the way uh, human rights are uh, being looked at and the kind of challenges it faces. Uh, let me begin with the broad introduction to the course. There are certain methodological issues I would like to discuss here. Uh, the first one obviously is what kind of teaching of human rights can we do in Global South? You may ask why is it so special? The reason being that much of human rights teaching in Euro-American universities is carried by a black letter law approach. So the materials of court records, legal documents, the United Nations resolutions and such other materials predominate in the way the materials are analyzed or concepts of human rights is explained. While it is a very important part of understanding human rights, we cannot and uh, we cannot confine ourselves to that understanding alone when we are actually looking at third world realities such as the context of India. That therefore we need to really work uh, creating materials that would supplement these particular kinds of hegemonic texts that are being in place in the Euro-American universities. The second most important methodological issue I would like to present is there is a dearth of theorization of lived experiences of constitutionalism and rights practice in Global South. And when I am saying there is a dearth of theorization, we first of all don't have documentation of a serious kind. We have human rights groups who generate certain kind of materials. Uh, they are more of everyday context of violations. Uh, there is not much of a real reflection with very few exceptions like the work of Professor Upendra Bakshi or uh, more recent work of people like Gayatri Spivak. A uh, few other scholars one could mention where there is a, an attempt to create a theoretical framework and provide insights into southern constitutionalism. And therefore, of course, we will depend upon the work of Professor Bakshi more and more as we delve into the details of this particular course. The third uh, aspect of this is the question of curricular standardization. Human rights has uh, been taught in national law schools and therefore in other universities subsequently from early 1990s. I think the pioneering work of Nandita Haksara I already mentioned. Uh, well, I suppose the subsequent context 
the efforts of the University Grants Commission and the National Human Rights Commission uh, to create a standardized curriculum in teaching of human rights in Indian universities took the curricularization question a long way. Uh, it is important uh, to record their key contributions and significance in the extension of the human rights and duties education in India. But still, I would like to submit that we have to go a long way in creating standardized curriculum materials because uh, the theorization of the experiences is still a great, great uh, limitation. Uh, I therefore would like to submit that while the course will draw with all the materials that we have, it will continue to speculate or try and provide certain conceptual tools to understand how the southern perspective of human rights could be looked at. And that would be a kind of key focus for the course. Now let me broadly say about human rights in our contemporary context. Uh, well, I suppose human rights is well known to many, uh, if not all. Uh, human rights is an idea that is very much in circulation for over 70 years, ever since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted in 1948 by the United Nations General Assembly. And since then, the idea has become uh, very popular. So, but people think whenever they see human rights, therefore it is a self-evident idea. There seem to be a growing problem in terms of seeing uniform meanings to universal notions like human rights. And we are going to delve into that particular issue as we go. In doing so, uh, we are encountering a particular uh, way of looking at human rights in the globalization context, uh, which is, I suppose, the persistence of the hegemonic narrative that human rights is an idea that started somewhere in Europe and then came to the rest of the world uh, and therefore it should be seen as a contribution of West to the rest and so on. So that's, I suppose, is the general narrative that continues and goes everywhere. And I think what globalization has presented to us is a situation where we need to see while historically or otherwise that might be the case, human rights acquired a very different meaning in many of these southern locations and that we need to decipher and without which we will not be able to adequately and meaningfully understand the idea of human rights in our own context. The third important uh, contextual fact I want to present is a growing recognition in the international human rights law of the value of diversity, um, whether it is the UNESCO Convention on the Protection of Cultural Diversity or whether it is the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in 2007 or uh, many such documents uh, of late recognize diversity as a global value as a value of the human family. Uh, the importance of this is to recognize that cultural diversity contributes to diversity of meaning making processes, which means it could be the same concept, but it could be understood and represented differently in different social situations. And we are going to see as we go in, these, in this course, uh, the details of those aspects of it. The fourth point I want to talk about is uh, human rights and the problem of stereotypes. Uh, the, the stereotypes are of various kind and human rights we generally take for granted that they always try and do good to the society. Uh, of late there is some work, especially I refer to the work of uh, Kenyan scholar Makau Matua, uh, whose uh, influential work uh, actually suggested that human rights can also perpetuate stereotypes. For instance, human rights are not immune to uh, gender stereotypes. Uh, for instance, the language of human rights continues to be patriarchal uh, unless it is questioned and transformed. Uh, in a very similar way, um, Matua informs us that the everyday discourse of human rights in the Euro-American world perpetuates a particular stereotype of a superior white male as a savior 
and a third world average citizen as a victim and the savage as the third world state violating the individual's rights. I'm saying those are important concepts to understand the other side of human rights. In other words, human rights is not immune to uh, generating stereotypes that could actually impede the very concept uh, that uh, is human rights. Right? So that's, I suppose, is what I would like to suggest. Okay, let us now go to the very idea of human rights and its story. I would like to say, whatever story that we know today of human rights is a partial story. And why do I say it is a partial story? One possibility of understanding this partial nature of the story of human rights that we know is the origins problem. So in other words, where are the human rights originating from? In history or in geography, for instance? Is it a European idea? Or is it something that originated in medieval Europe? Or what is the way that one should look at it? Well, to say in a different way that all societies had human relations across history, all human societies had models of state building and governance structures, uh, and therefore every society must have had certain ways of regulating the populations. Human rights, of course, in a historical context emerged in a particular thought process in Europe. That, of course, is a fact that we should recognize. But whether the same notion that came as human rights in Roman law or natural law, uh, whether the idea of uh, rights emerged exclusively from the European tradition of natural law or uh, from the practices of common law in England, uh, or can we really say that such practices existed everywhere, but the terminologies could be different, the methodologies of application could be different, and so on. So in other words, there is need to understand the origins problem far more openly than what so far has been seen for those who are interested in history. But for our particular context, I would only mention that it is a problem and then I will move on to give the partial story as it is available to us. One way of tracing the idea of human rights is to trace back to the tradition of natural law in European thought. Um, one side of natural law thinking comes from the ecclesiastical thought process. Those who are part of a church uh, and those who have written treatises on natural law is one part of that. Uh, the key point about that aspect of natural law is that there is a feeling that natural law is there in the divine gift in the human world and human beings must understand through application of reason. And so in that sense of the term, uh, natural law is uh, beginning uh, to understand that there is a particular way human beings will follow what is available to us in the form of natural law and one aspect of that is to understand natural rights. This particular thought process acquired a further significance with the rise of social contract theory in 17th and 18th century European thought, uh, particularly the work of Thomas Hobbes, John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau and their work informs a different kind of connection between natural rights and natural law, where natural rights were seen as inalienable rights and some of them seen as alienable rights. And therefore, the formation of the state seemed to have happened with the possibility of alienating those which are related to, for instance, um, taking decisions uh, about regulation of society or maintaining peace, security of the society and so on. But the inalienable rights are right to life and right to liberty and of course some other catalogue that is uh, not entirely consistent. For some philosophers property is an in, inalienable in right but for some others happiness is some such kind of a right. So there is a tradition of natural law that we could trace as the origins of idea of human rights being present. The other tradition that often is referred to is the tradition of 
English common law which begins with the declaration of Magna Carta in the year 1215 when King John lost his war against his barons who then demanded the declaration of Magna Carta. Magna Carta is historically seen as an important document that made sovereign sign a document which declared the king is not above the law. Right? That's an important principle even today in modern democracies where even the highest functionary of the state is not above the law. So in other words, Magna Carta initiated uh, a principle of rule of law in medieval European context. From the Magna Carta context, there has been a tradition of a variety of struggles, movements that seem to have created momentum for articulating the ideas of rights. A most significant development we need to pause to recount is the 18th century democratic revolutions in United States and France and the declaration of the rights of man and citizen. And these documents first time articulate the universal spirit of the rights and imagine the human being as a universal species being, which I think politically a very significant development through those documents that happen to percolate down. Then I would recount most important uh, landmarks in this story being the 19th century movements, uh, anti-slavery movement, the franchise movements of the working class, of women and so on. All of them have articulated their interests in the language of constitution and in the language of rights. And I think that's a great shift in the way people seem to have represented their grievances. So first time in 19th century, we see people from the margins articulating their interests, articulating their concerns in the language of rights. And then of course 20th century, we have a Holocaust and then of course the subsequent development of major international law from the beginning of United Nations organization in 1945 and the passing of the Charter of the United Nations. And that's the context and then we of course have an entire body of the human rights documentation. So you have your Universal Declaration in 1948 and then a series of conventions which now run into hundreds that document, codify, catalog a variety of rights that are declared as universally applicable for all human beings. And that's in substance and a nutshell the overall background story of how the idea of human rights emerged historically. <clears throat> you may ask why it is to be seen as a partial story and I would give you uh, f about four or five reasons why this is to be seen as a partial story. There are many more reasons but I will confine to about four or five. And the first one obviously I would like to highlight is in the entire corpus of writings on human rights until recently, there is an absolute silence on the problem of colonialism. Uh, colonialism is a widespread problem. South America, Africa, Asia by and large were under colonial control with few exceptions. But colonialism does not figure in the articulations of human rights, which I think is a great omission to understand why it happened so. And therefore, one of the ways of saying that human rights story is a partial story is the non-representation of the colonial question makes it partial. The second thing that I would like to highlight is ever since human rights became an important value, the immediate period that followed was a Cold War period, a tension between the capitalist USA and the social, socialist USSR. And I think that tension led to a politicization of human rights question. So human rights was used as a foreign policy tool to delegitimize the non-capitalist world. From that moment onwards, many Western countries use human rights as a political tool, which often creates problems of understanding the normative questions of human rights. 
Uh, and that to me creates also a partial aspect of the human rights story. The third is persistence of certain stereotypes in the representation of human rights. Um, for instance, uh, as I already mentioned about the gender bias that persists in human rights language, until very uh, recently, uh, the question is whether a domestic violence is a human rights violation because uh, the Convention Against Torture does not recognize domestic violence as a violation in the domestic sphere. It is only torture is something that is committed by either by state or on behalf of state. And therefore, the private sphere was excluded. And I think those are the sorts of stereotypes that continue to plague and there is need to really unravel those stereotypes and then remedy them. And I think therefore that aspect of partiality exists. The fourth one I would like to say is about not recognizing a number of groups as part and parcel of human beings. Uh, the question of caste in India um, would stand out as an important issue to understand it. And now, of course, you have a, a campaign for Dalit human rights at the national level. But the question whether violence against the lower castes, is it a human rights violation, was a major debate in civil liberties movement in India not very long ago, in the mid-1980s. And finally, I would like to say the most important point that we don't really uh, have, and therefore that makes uh, the human rights story partial, is we don't really have an idea as to how the idea of human rights, which is as available in international human rights law, gets percolated down into everyday life of uh, much of the rest of the world, especially in southern world like India. What are the ways by which such ideas are captured by common citizens? And how do they help in representing these citizens' interest in the right fora in terms of representing before a commission or any such sort of uh, institution. That kind of work in terms of understanding how specialist local interest gets translated into languages of human rights and therefore making the meaning of certain concepts very different is something that obviously we don't really have adequate understanding about. And that to me is another reason why the idea of human rights becomes uh, partial as it is available to us at this point. So my substance in this particular question is to say that we must recognize those limitations of partialities. Well, the most now the question comes as to what then is a southern perspective of human rights? Is there a southern perspective at all? I would highlight four points in order to say what may be a way of looking at Southern perspective. And I'm deriving exclusively from those scholars' work that I already mentioned about. The first thing about a Southern perspective of human rights is to be conscious of the partial nature of the story, which I emphasized already. In other words, the, the most important point to begin is that human rights as an idea is a partial idea, and there are different ways of identifying that partial nature of it and we must continue to engage and critique that. That, I suppose, is the point that I'm underscoring. The second one is to engage and contribute to the critique of omissions. When I'm saying omissions, as I said, the gender language that plagues the human rights concept, or the not including populations of lower caste into human rights for All that happened through a particular way of critiquing, and I think that was very, very central in terms of uh, thinking about human rights from a southern perspective. The third one I would like to say is continuously demystifying uh, political instrumentalism and stereotypes. In other words, recognizing what is a political instrumental way of using human rights and what is a genuine way of human, using human rights. And I think that distinction one has to make conceptually. And a southern perspective I would like to submit is very necessary in order to be able to understand that distinction. And the fourth one uh, is the most important one, is attempting to theorize diverse lived experiences of rights practice. So in other words, rights practices exist all over the world, particularly in the third world context, 
a number of lawyers use different strategies, different methods of representing and defending human rights of various political movements, groups, individuals, and so on. And we need certain tools and methods to theorize that particular kind of practice. And I think the very fact that we are looking to our own society and say we need to theorize this, for me, is possible only if we have a southern perspective of human rights. And I think these four points I am indicatively presenting to you to say southern perspective is not a very, very established understanding, but we must work towards it in order to make human rights a far more richer idea, a far more comprehensive idea, and a far more meaningful idea. And that's what I would like to say. So I would like to broadly conclude uh, with the uh, one strong point that so from the southern perspective of human rights, we must recognize, first of all, that there is a duality in the concept. And the duality is human rights in one way is hegemonic and in another way it is transformative. And hegemonic is the idea which is talking about a particular grand narrative of human rights where the Europe and America are in the center stage and they are actually thinking and articulating and conceptualizing what rights are and that is being presented to the rest of the world and the rest of the world is in the recipient mode. Human rights transformative, using uh, Upendra Bakshi's phrase, uh, would be that which is the way a number of uh, groups, individuals, appropriate that hegemonic idea and try and represent in their own interest context of survival, existings, or representations of various forms of suffering. Both are uh, important, but the distinction is to be recognized as a very, very important one from our perspective. The transformative human rights, on the other hand, is a process where constantly human rights are deployed to democratize and improve the lives of the people who are on the margins. And that journey, I think, is not a straightforward one because in many situations, that kind of deployment through institutions not always resulting in empowerment of the individuals. There is a point to consider here, but transformative human rights as opposed to hegemonic human rights is a distinction that would help us to recognize the contours of human rights from a southern perspective. We will conclude with that point here today. We will take up uh, the next theme in module 2. Thank you.